Kyle's new competitive strategy is to bring his contagion to CES and infect everybody, which is what I think he got Luke too. So bear with me for this one, voice a little hoarse, but uh, we have the EVGA RTX 2060 to review today, and this is the XE Ultra model, particularly looking at it versus the FE model from NVIDIA. And this is interesting because NVIDIA has been sort of encroaching on the territory of board partners with its Founders Edition designs. Now that it's gone dual axial, for example, and the price point is no longer special for the 2060. So you've got a $350 FE model versus this, and this is somewhere in the 370 to 380 range. So a bit of a price difference, but is it worth it is what we're looking at today. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Open Bench Table, a lightweight and ultra portable test bench built with high quality anodized aluminum and with a modular approach to design. The open bench table is easy to collapse, store, and assemble to test different parts, and is one of the test benches that we use in the GN Labs. The open bench table contains everything you need to test PC builds and configurations, and it's available in silver, black, red, and a mini ITX version. Learn more at the link in the description below. I'm going to keep this one really short and to the point today so that none of us has to be down with the sickness longer than necessary. Uh, so the primary testing here is on thermals, noise, and overclocking because ultimately, when you're looking at two video cards of the same silicon tie, a GTX or an RTX 2060, it's thermals. That's really what you're comparing ultimately. Silicon quality will dictate overclocking to some extent, the cooler to some extent, and then beyond that, the stock performance, pretty much identical, because it's, it's the same GPU, it's similar frequencies, so in games, you're not gonna see much of a difference, but there's still value to an aftermarket card. And most of that is going to be in things like silence or uh, just better cooling, more efficient cooling overall. So EVGA's card here, the XE Ultra, it's very similar to the FE card. There's one difference, and that's the MLCC components. One of the MLCC components uh, has changed, which reduces some of the whine, that coil whine. It's not the coils that are whining typically. Uh, it's one of the other components on the board. So that's been changed. And at least on our unit here, the review unit, we don't hear any whine, whereas we did with the FE model now. It's hard to say with a sample size of one for each, but it should be improved on EVGAs versus NVIDIAs. Cooler design is simple. It's a two slot card with two fans. So sizing form factor is the same as the FE card. Uh, it is significantly easier to take apart, which is a benefit. It has a zero RPM mode, which is a benefit for some of you from a noise standpoint. But otherwise, it's pretty simple and pretty, uh, pretty much the same as the FE card. So let's get into it. Let's go through the thermals noise and overclocking. We'll look at like two games just to kind of give you an idea of why it doesn't make sense to compare in games because it's the same GPU, so it's going to perform the same. But we'll look at a couple anyway just to illustrate that point. For the power virus thermal chart, we're plotting temperature of the GPU core, a hotspot MOSFET, and a memory module near the memory VRM. The EVGA RTX 2060 XC Ultra lands its GPU temperature at 67 degrees Celsius, its stock target, operating a fan speed of about 2000 RPM. MOSFET thermals landed at 76 degrees Celsius, with memory thermals at about 80 degrees Celsius. These are well within spec and nowhere near problematic. GDDR6 can take about 90 to 95 degrees under spec, with MOSFETs taking 125 to 150 degrees Celsius. EVGA's cooler is fine in a vacuum, but we need to see how it does versus the slightly cheaper Founders Edition card. We can drop VRAM thermals to simplify the chart, and then add Founders Edition thermals. Adding FE GPU thermals to the chart, we see that NVIDIA's card averages about 1 to 2 degrees higher, insignificant in the grand scheme of things. This is with a fan speed of about 1700 RPM, and the Founders Edition MOSFET plots at 3 degrees higher than EVGA's, running 78 degrees Celsius instead of 75 to 76 degrees, and it's also insignificant in its differences. Let's next compare the 3D Mark frequency and thermals versus the Founders Edition and XE Ultra cards. Starting first with the EVGA XC Ultra at stock settings, we see out-of-the-box thermals ramping to 67 degrees Celsius, which is its target temperature. Remember that ambient is controlled and constant at about 22 degrees for these tests that accounted for in results tallying. The XC Ultra ramps harder to its 67 degree temperature as its fans start from zero RPM and climb once passing a threshold. The XC Ultra's frequency runs at 1935 MHz core, stable throughout the test, falling from about 2000 as a starting point. Plotting the Founders Edition card now, we see temperature ramp to about 68 to 69 degrees, occasionally peaking at 70 degrees Celsius. 
the climb is more gradual, as the minimum fan speed is close to 800 RPM. The frequency climbs to about 1935 MHz peak and falls to 1875 MHz sustained. While that is a difference, it isn't all that meaningful in terms of frame rate or frame times. Regardless, EVGA's car does run faster on average, with GPU core thermals marginally different at best. To even detect these thermal differences requires strict testing routines, so you wouldn't realistically notice the GPU core difference in day-to-day -day use. Finally, normalizing both coolers to 40 dBA to equalize the playing field, we see the results in the chart now. Rather than plot these slowly, we'll just show it as it is. The FE and XC Ultra cards both hit the same MOSFET temperature of 73 degrees, with GPU temperature reaching 64 to 66 degrees on each device. These are roughly within error margins, or close enough to be indistinguishable. For the EVGA card, unfortunately, it performs functionally equivalently to the NVIDIA RTX 2060 FE card. This speaks miles to NVIDIA's new effort to make actually good coolers, with the company only significantly behind in its assembly efforts. Moving on to just noise testing, we must first note that EVGA's XC Ultra has a zero RPM mode, something that the Founders Edition card doesn't have. This, coupled with the fact that our EVGA XC Ultra model had no coil whine, means that the 2060 XC Ultra produces effectively no noise under minimal loads. The fan speeds up to about 38 dBA at 1850 RPM, 41 dBA at 2200 RPM, and 55.4 if you were to ever set it to maximum fan speeds. The NVIDIA Founders Edition, meanwhile, plots 1 to 2 dBA higher at any given fan RPM. This is good for EVGA's value proposition, but as we saw in the previous chart, NVIDIA's cooler is functionally equivalent in most thermal testing at a given dBA. EVGA can spin faster at the same volume, but cools similarly to NVIDIA's FE at a lower RPM and equivalent noise level. The only major advantage here is that EVGA's card didn't have any noticeable coil whine. This can vary from card to card, overclocking always comes down to silicon quality more than anything else, but good coolers will aid in higher overclocks as a result of lower thermals. In this instance, putting an OC stepping chart on the screen, we see the EVGA XC Ultra struggling to get beyond an offset of 130 MHz core, landing its stable average frequency at 2055 MHz when at steady state. The memory frequency technically achieved an average offset of 930 MHz in time spy, but had to be dropped to 900 MHz and below in order to pass any games in testing. Furthermore, a memory offset greater than 800 MHz on average produced worse results than stock testing, providing evidence of memory errors and unstable overclocks that overall are less impressive than what we got in the Founders Edition model. And this again is a silicon quality question. Speaking of, let's add that OC stepping chart to the bottom half of the screen for the Founders Edition model. With a similar maximum power to the EVGA card, both at 185 to 190 watts, the RTX 2060 FE ended up at about 2030 MHz core at steady state or 2055 peak. The card was stable at memory offsets of over 900 MHz in most tests, though could achieve higher in some synthetic workloads. EVGA's XC Ultra did not offer any advantages in overclocking to the Founders Edition card. Games aren't particularly worth showing to illustrate differences, as most of the advantage of an aftermarket card is its cooling solution, its noise levels, and overclocking capabilities. And we've already demonstrated limited improvements there, but let's just walk through a few of our game tests to illustrate the real-world frame rate differences. We'll strictly talk about 2060 cards here. If you want to hear analysis on performance of other options, watch or read the initial 2060 review. With Sniper Elite 4 at 4K, primarily for a synthetic load as this game runs so well, we see the RTX 2060 XC Ultra at 58 FPS average when stock, with lows reasonably well timed and equally spaced to other tests. Overclocking gets it to about 60 FPS average, proving troublesome for memory stability or finding it, anyway. The 2060 FE card performed lower when stock, technically at 56 FPS average, but this delta is undetectable to the player. Overclocking also provided meaningless gains at 61 FPS average when overclocked versus the 60 FPS of the XC Ultra overclock. Note that the core offset gets both devices to roughly the same frequency as the XC Ultra starts at a higher baseline. At 1080p, Sniper Elite positions the cards similarly to the previous benchmarks. EVGA's XC Ultra runs a higher frame rate out of the box at 156 FPS average versus 151 FPS average, but that's just from a higher stock boost clock. Beyond this, differences are difficult to detect for a human player. 
These are measurable differences, but they're imperceptible ones. Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1440p gives us an insightful look at the earlier references to unstable overclocks. In this testing, the EVGA RTX 2060 XE Ultra placed 70 FPS when stock, average, marginally improved over the Founders Edition at 68 FPS. That said, the memory overclock of 840 MHz to 930 MHz offset produced worse results than stock. This is indicative of memory errors and stability concerns, reducing performance more than helping it. Even with a stable overclock, the 2060 FE caps out at about 73 FPS average. Enough tuning would eventually get the EVGA card here as well, but the silicon quality is more difficult to work with on our model than the FE card. This will vary card to card and is not guaranteed on any device, including the FE. Regardless, even with stable clocks, there's no meaningful difference. Now, this is where it gets really interesting in the conclusion because since NVIDIA is now good enough with their FE design for a 2060, not the same for the 2080s, too much power there, but for the 2060, NVIDIA is pretty competitive. And that comes back to what we were saying about how NVIDIA is sort of starting to take market share from its board partners. And the only downside there, NVIDIA doesn't have as much distribution power, so they can't reach out into as many non-US regions as easily. NVIDIA mostly sells through NVIDIA.com, so that's a, uh, a hamstring as well. But the board partners now have to compete with their supplier, and that's hard because to ex for this to really be competitive, it needs to be at the same price as the FE. If you're really serious about wine, then this theoretically should be better. I, I can't 100% state uh, with confidence that it's always better because we only have one, so sample size of one, but it should be better. If you're really neurotic about noise at low RPMs or at low loads, this is better because zero RPM mode. But other than that, there's not really any advantages. And that's just kind of unfortunate. And EVGA can't compete with NVIDIA at the same price point because EVGA has to buy the GPU from NVIDIA. NVIDIA makes it for cost. They don't buy it from anybody. So as this goes on, it'll be interesting to see if NVIDIA starts forcing people out of the, the more affordable price classes if they don't establish that $100 difference between the FE models and the cheapest board partner models, uh, which doesn't exist for the 2060. And that's, that's really kind of the, uh, the point of concern here is what happens to that board partner ecosystem because uh, NVIDIA is doing a few things that are a bit Apple-like and, and we find that concerning. But uh, objectively, their cooler on the 2060 is good enough to be competitive with something like this, and it's cheaper. So it's probably, on average, a better buy for the money, uh, unless you really care about the coil line, you really care about zero RPM mode, or you want it to be easy to service, because this is six screws to get the cooler assembly off, and then it's like another maybe eight or so to get the base plate off. It's pretty trivial, really. So those are the advantages of EVGA, but just not a strong enough argument to really establish a firm reason to buy it at the higher price, which is very unfortunate in this generation. But uh, if NVIDIA is going to push their partners to compete with better designs, that's good. It's just that NVIDIA's got a bit of an unfair advantage there because they get the GPU for cost. So hard to compete with that. Anyway, not particularly worth buying unless you care about those specific scenarios deeply, in which case it is worth buying, I suppose. But that's it for this one. Subscribe for more as always. Go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. And uh, go to Kyle's channel and accuse him of getting me sick. I'll see you all next time.